to one of them who was his teacher, um, Dante. Now, now we get to the usurers, and these are the, this is the crime against art. That's, that's how it's produced. Now, art in the medieval worldview was production. It was the idea of production, that you produce things. Christ, in his three-year mission, the only time he gets violent is with the usurers, chasing them out of uh, the temple. Now, if you look at the Abrahamic, you can look at these. These are all in Exodus, um, Leviticus. Um, Take no usury or interest from him, but fear your God that your brother may live with you. You shall not lend him your money for usury, nor lend him your food at a profit. If one of your brethren becomes poor and falls into poverty among you, then you shall help him like a stranger or a sojourner that he may live with you. And then uh, to a foreigner you may charge interest. It's interesting, St. Jerome and if you look at the early church fathers, St. Jerome has a, a very famous statement about ubi uh, jus belli, uh, ubi etiam jus usuri. If it's just to wage war on them, it's just to charge usury. That's how he understood that, that the, that the, the stranger was actually somebody who was an enemy. And then this was the jubilee. Right? You know what they would say today, our economists? Oh, that creates moral hazard. <laughs> right? Seriously, that's exactly how, the, how they would look at that. And then this is uh, Ezekiel also, right? So, uh, and, and this is a just man who does what's lawful and right. He doesn't eat on the mountains where the idolaters used to eat, nor lifted his eyes to idols, nor defiled his neighbor's wife, nor approached a woman in her impurity. If he has not oppressed anyone, but he has restored the debtor to his pledge, he's robbed no one by violence, taken no usury. If he had not extracted usury, nor taken any increase, but has withdrawn his hand from iniquity and executed true justice between a man and a man. If he has walked in my statutes and kept my just judgments faithfully, he is just. Now, in the Jewish tradition, uh, and the Jews in, in European tradition were forced into usury. It's very interesting if you study, they used to, the, a lot of the European sovereigns would have the Jews as tax collectors. This is like having African American police in inner cities. Do you know, it's, 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 it's kind of, it, I mean, that's an opposite example of that. It's trying to deflect, but it's, what the tax collector, when he was Jewish, if he would come, they would see the Jew and not the sovereign. So they would see the Jew as an oppressor. And that was literally designed. I mean, these people were, were Machiavellian in their, in, their, uh, in their outlook. So, but this is from uh, the Talmud, Every Man's Talmud by Dr. Cohen. One method of earning a living, which was condemned in scathing terms by the rabbis, was usury. A man who practiced it was precluded from giving evidence in a court of law. Come and see the blindness of the usurers. If a man call his fellow a villain, the latter proceeds against him even to the extent of depriving him of his livelihood. But usurers take witnesses, scribe pen and ink, and write and seal the document to the effect. I mean, Woody Guthrie put that in a more popular phrase when he said, some men will rob you with a six gun and some with a fountain pen. And so that's what he's alluding to. But he said, no matter how far you roam, you'll never see an outlaw take a family from its home. Not like the bankers. Whoever has money and lends it without interest of him is written, he that putteth not out his money to usury shall never be moved. Hence you can learn that if a man lends on interest, his possessions will be moved. Usurers are comparable to shedders of blood. Cato, the elder, was asked about usury. He said, usury? Ask me about murder. He equated it with murder. And there's reasons for that that the modern people don't understand, unfortunately, because we don't fully grasp it. One of the most important things, and, and this is why it's so good to see this issue being addressed. Justo Gonzalez, and I would recommend reading this book, Faith and Wealth, A History of Early Christian Ideas on the Origin, Significance, and Use of Money. In Gonzalez's book, what he shows very clearly is one of the most central and important issues that Christians were grappling with was the ethical use of wealth. They were obsessed with it in their writings. But what he says, on the outlines of the actual relationship between faith and wealth, there is, there is also remarkable unanimity. It's one of the few things they really agreed on. To the point that certain themes appear again and again. Usury, by which is usually meant any loan on interest, is universally condemned. 
in the early church. The one possible exception is Clement of Alexandria who may have held that the prescription of loans on interest applies only to loans to other believers. But even this possibility is based uh, only on a debatable interpretation of a single text. So usury was seen as condemned. Um, and, and this is obviously the chasing them out. Love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything. Right? Even your enemies. So this is really abrogating that idea of lending to the, the, the enemy, which is why he put it in there. And it's interesting that modern Christians have justified usury with the, the Luke story about the man who comes uh, with the, the talons and he gives his, each one, he gives him ten and five and one, and then two of them work it, and the third one, he, he just hides it, and he says, oh, I knew you were an austere and cruel man, and you take what's not yours, and you reap what you don't sow. So I just hid it, and here it is. Here, and he said, you, your, your condemnation of me is my judgment against you. You should have known that I would have wanted more, and you should have put it in a bank and gotten interest. So he uses the example of a wicked tyrant that everybody hates and says, well, there's Jesus. He's Saying usury is okay. <laughs> Very weird interpretation, but hey, that's scripture. Yeah. The nature of the sin called usury has its proper place and origin in a loan contract. This financial contract between consenting parties demands by its very nature that one return to another only as much as he has received. The sin rests on the fact that something the creditor desires more than he's given. Therefore, he contends some gain is allowed to him beyond that which he loaned, but any gain which exceeds the amount he gave is illicit and usurious. This is an encyclical, a papal encyclical, which is basically church doctrine. The Pope writes it and then sends it out to all the churches. This is not ex cathedra. In other words, it's not considered infallible because the popes rarely use ex cathedra um, as a doctrine. And... Um, but this was sent in 1745. It was all over by Pope Benedict uh, the 14th. And then it was again applied to the encyclical to the whole of the Roman Catholic Church in 1836 during the reign of Pope Gregory. And Dr. Noonan, one of the great Catholic scholars, says that it's impossible to say that there was not universal agreement on, on the prohibition of usury. Charging for the loan of money is unjust as such, for you are selling something that doesn't exist. This is the important distinction that the, the medievals understood that money is a means of exchange. It is not meant in and of itself to be a source of income. You can invest money by buying goods and products and selling them as a businessman. But when you loan money and make money off the money, you have perverted the purpose of money, which is a means of exchange, and you have made it an end, as a good is an end. This is how they understood it. The word in Greek for usury was tokos, which means to give birth. And this is why he has them on a barren, sandy uh, completely unfertile because what they've done is they've made something that should be unfertile in its essence. But it causes things to grow if it's used properly. And so this is, this is St. Thomas saying some things like food are consumed by use so that the use can be separated from the thing. When we let someone use such things, then we transfer the ownership of the thing itself. So if you sell a sandwich, you've transferred the ownership of sandwich. And so the use of the sandwich, was, which it's consumption, is you can't charge them for that. And that's why bankers literally get their cake and eat it too. Literally, it's amazing. So, so, now when we let somebody use such things, then we transfer the ownership. If we tried to sell wine and its use separately, we would be selling the same thing twice. Over or selling something non-existent that would clearly be unjust. By the same token, then it is unjust to lend wine and then ask for the twofold recompense, the restoration of some equivalent and charge for its use. This is what usury is, a use charge in such cases. There are, however, things which are not, and this is beautiful. St. Thomas always preempts what you're going to object to. Right? He, I mean, really, he's quite stunning in that he constantly does that. He just, he thinks, okay, what are they going to say to this one? And then, boom, he answers you. 
So he said, there are, however, things which are not consumed by use. A house is used by living in it, not by pulling it down. So here we can separate the thing from its use. Transferring the ownership, for example, while reserving the use for a time or vice versa, allowing someone the use and retaining its ownership. This is why one can licitly charge for a house's use and later ask for its return, as happens in letting and renting. So now Aristotle tells us money was invented for the purpose of exchange and that it's, its prime and proper use is in its consumption and disbursement by being spent in transactions. It follows that it is in principle wrong to charge for the loan of money as is done in usury. Now in the Islamic view, those who devour usury will rise only like the one who rises to be knocked down by a demon as if possessed by madness. My teacher, Sheikh Abdullah bin Bayyah, who's, who's one of the foremost authorities on Islamic finance, said that this is the boom-bust cycle of a usurious society. They rise only to be knocked down. And this will happen again and again throughout history. The Quran says, those who consume interest cannot stand except as one stands who is, who is being beaten by Satan, a, a, a demon. Oh, you have believed, do not consume usury doubled and multiplied, but fear that you may be uh, in order to be successful. Now, in traditional views of all forms of wealth acquisition, the most unnatural and odious is that by means of usury, Aristotle and the politics. John Addison, I love this one. A money lender, he serves you in the present tense, he lends you in the conditional mood, keeps you in the subjunctive, and ruins you in the future. <laughs> I mean, really great stuff. Right? Nothing like the English for stringing words together. Usury dulls and damps all industries, improvements, and new inventions, wherein money would be stirring if it were not for this slug. Provision, and that's why, why, how are they trying to stimulate the economy now? They just keep lowering the interest rate, right? Just keep lowering it down. But there's deeper problems, and this is, I'm going to get to this. Um, anyway, John Maynard Keene says this, very interesting, that he, used to, he was brought up to believe that the attitude of the church was, to the rate of interest was inherently absurd, and that the subtle discussions aimed at distinguishing between the re return of money loans from the return of active investments were merely Jesuitical attempts to find a practical escape from a foolish theory. But I now read these discussions at, as an honest intellectual effort to keep separate what classical theory has inextricably confused together, the rate of interest and the marginal efficiency of capital. And he distinguished, he invented the marginal efficiency of capital. So that's the nice thing about inventing your own terms is that uh, you define them as well. So, but he basically, the marginal efficiency of, counts, uh, of capital is what it's worth which is not necessary the interest rate. So most economists would see it as the same thing. He saw it as different, but his point was is that they recognize there is a difference between the capital itself and, and, and the interest itself, and they distinguish between those two. And, and, but its prohibition is, is for a very different reason. I 